Hello and welcome to Volusia Magazine. I'm Amber Osman. In this week's episode, sea turtle nesting season is off to a quick start with a rare Kemp's Ridley finding the county beach. Tryouts are fast approaching for this summer's junior lifeguards, and the March airport numbers are in. Later on in the program, Joanne Magley sits down with Chad Weber with the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. Those segments and more coming right up on Volusia Magazine. I hope you stay tuned. With a milder winter and Atlantic water temperatures climbing into the 70s, a rare Kemp's Ridley sea turtle nested early on the beach in Volusia County. The turtle was spotted on the beach making her nest in Ponce Inlet this week. According to Jennifer Winters, Habitat Conservation Plan Manager with Volusia County's Environmental Management, the Kemp's Ridley is a critically endangered species and is considered the rarest sea turtle species found nesting in Florida. While the nesting season in Volusia County officially begins May 1st, this early nest is not out of the ordinary because of the warm ocean temperatures. In fact, early nesters have also been recorded on beaches south of Volusia County this year. Turtles are triggered to start nesting based on the water temperature. So some years when the water temperature is um, around 74 degrees, they'll start nesting a little bit earlier than May 1. Beachside residents and visitors are reminded that sea turtle nesting season continues through October 31st. During nesting season, residents are required to turn off, shield, or redirect light so they don't shine onto the beach. I do feel like you need to use a light for safety. Um, try to use a, a light that has a red or amber um, long wavelength filter on it. Um, even the, the amber LEDs that you can buy that, that change um, from white to red are good because the red spectrum is less visible to sea turtles and can be less disruptive to their nesting behavior. If you see a nesting adult sea turtle or hatchlings making their way to the ocean, admire them from a distance. If a turtle appears to be in immediate danger, notify a lifeguard or beach safety officer, or you can call the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission at 888-404-3922. For information about Volusia County's sea turtle program, you can call 386-238-4668 or you can visit volusiaseaturtles.org. For questions about lighting, call 386-238-4773. The number of travelers going in and out of the Daytona Beach International Airport stayed consistent over last March's numbers despite losing several flights due to inclement weather up north. Passenger traffic at Daytona Beach International Airport decreased 1% for March in comparison with March of last year. During the month, 70,023 passengers flew in or out of the county-operated airport, compared to 70,936 passengers last March. For the 12 months ending in March, total passenger traffic at DAB has increased 9.2 percent with 648,086 passengers traveling through the facility last year compared to 708,116 passengers this year. The weather has wreaked a little havoc on our total passenger traffic numbers, but with last year being the highest passenger traffic numbers we've seen in 20 years, we expected this year to be relatively flat. And that's what we saw in March as well. So March is our busiest month of the entire year, and we were pretty much on par with what we saw last year. The weather this spring in the central and northeast regions of the U.S. was unusually disruptive, triggering significant flight disruptions across the country. The weather and cancellations did have slight impacts on total passenger numbers. However, the airport has seen load factors for JetBlue service increase each month this year, which is very encouraging. The great thing about this March is that JetBlue had its highest load factor since they've been here. We've made progress in January, February, and now March now uh, with JetBlue increasing over the previous year. So that's really, really good going forward. Currently, three airlines serve Daytona Beach International Airport. JetBlue, which offers daily nonstop service to New York City. Delta, which offers nonstop service to Atlanta. 
and American, which flies nonstop to Charlotte. For more information, you can visit flydab.com. From feathers and beaks to flippers and fins, eco camps at the Marine Science Center are sure to get the kids excited about our rich marine environment. This week on Volusia Here and Now, Shelly Safranik is in Ponce Inlet to learn more about the upcoming summer programs. The Marine Science Center in Ponce Inlet is an educational gateway to the rich marine environment in Volusia County. Since opening in 2002, the Marine Science Center has cared for more than 19,000 sea turtles, gopher tortoises, freshwater turtles, and snakes. The Mary Keller Seabird Rehabilitation Facility at the Marine Science Center has received more than 13,000 birds since opening in 2004. It's easy to spend a day here learning about marine life in the center's exhibit hall, which includes a 1,400 gallon touch pool, which features cow nose rays and hermit crabs, a 5,000 gallon artificial reef aquarium, living reef, and octopus and moray eels exhibits. Visitors to the center also can watch turtles and birds receive specialized care, visit habitats for bald eagles and wading birds, walk along the nature trail, and climb the observation tower. With so much to see and do at the Marine Science Center, it's easy to see why spending more time here would be exciting for kids. And thanks to summer camps offered at the Marine Science Center, they can. This year we're gonna be offering 10 weeks of summer camps. It's going to begin on June 8th and they'll last until August 8th. And uh, you know, we actually have people who actually uh, set up their entire uh, summer vacation around sending their children to our camp. Uh, we'll have them contact us as early as uh, December and January to say, hey, we're going to be in the Daytona Beach area. Uh, we want to know when the right week for our age group child is uh, going to be available so that we can uh, tie our vacation in with a chance to explore the uh, wonders of Volusia County with your summer camps. The summer camps are primarily targeted to kids who are 9 to 14 years of age. Hours of the camp are 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. with the exception of canoe days. Yes, the kids in the five-day camp have an opportunity to go canoeing. As brothers explained, camp participants who are 9 to 14 years of age can spend more time with the Marine Science Center and also have a chance to explore the marine environment right outside its doors. You know, a day at summer camp is, is always varied. Uh, there are so many different things for them to understand about what we do here at the Marine Science Center that some of them are based right here uh, at our facility. And so they have a chance to uh, go through all of our exhibits, through our aquariums, to learn more about the organisms that we have on exhibit and also about the sea turtle and our bird hospitals. So they get exposure to what we do here at the Science Center. But also we use the Science Center as a jumping off point uh, to be able to move out and get out into the real world because uh, one of our great beliefs is that uh, kids need to be outside and they need to be exposed to the real thing and whether that's the real thing and being in our exhibits or whether it's even better to be outside and in the mangroves and get wet and in the mangroves, in a salt marsh, have a chance to explore our beaches, have a chance to feel what it's like to be uh, on the water and in a, uh, a canoe or a kayak and exploring uh, these wonderful environments that we have all around us here in Volusia County. As brothers mentioned, the summer camps are very popular at the Marine Science Center. So popular, the center expanded its offerings and in addition to the week-long camp, they will also have three two-day camps for children ages six to eight. Hours of the two-day camps are 9 a.m. to 3.30 p.m. Those younger children, of course, the daily activities are not as ambitious, you know, we don't do quite the same things with them, but it is an introduction, a chance for even these young children to learn more about the remarkable uh, marine environments of Volusia County. To register for the Marine Science Center summer camps, contact Shell Webster, the education coordinator, at 386 304 
1-800-273-5529 or send an email to mscedu.evolutia.org. For more information about the Marine Science Center, visit marinesciencecenter.com. For Volusia Here and Now, I'm Shelley Safranik. Hey, do you have youngsters in your family that just can't get enough of the beach? If so, Volusia County Beach Safety might just have the thing for them this summer. Youths between the ages of 9 and 15 years who are looking for sun, fun, and water might find an end to summertime boredom in the Junior Lifeguard Program. Now in its 28th year, the program teaches participants about beach safety in a fun and challenging atmosphere. Professional lifeguards teach water safety and first aid techniques. Junior lifeguards will participate in daily team relays involving surfboard paddling, swimming, running, and beach flags. The five-day camps also help to build self-confidence and prepare participants for work as lifeguards. It's a full day. It's very physically exhausting for these kids, which I, I believe they need. And they, uh, they're, they love it. I mean, it's like I said, they come, they come out on the beach. It's the camaraderie. Um, it teaches them uh, discipline, teamwork, and it's, it's a great program. Uh, I, like I said before, my son started it at the age of nine until the age he became an actual lifeguard. Tryouts for Volusia County's Junior Lifeguard Program start May 6th. To be eligible for the program, participants must pass the swim requirements, which are to swim 100 yards in no more than 2 minutes and 15 seconds, tread water for 5 minutes, swim underwater for 10 feet. Tryouts will be held Saturdays through June 17th at locations throughout the county. For more information, you can visit volusia.org beach. You can call 386-547-0246 or you can email juniorlifeguard at volusia.org. Hiking, biking, and paddling are just a few of the things that you can do with the county's Explore Volusia program. Gary Daniels takes us along for an inside look into these eco-adventures. ride was through the um, heavy growth. It's cool, lots to look at, the bridge was neat, it was, it was just very nice. We're new here so we're trying to get experience with everything that's available and this is just an awesome program. Explore Volusia is from the Volusia Forever program where Volusia County voted to tax themselves over 20 years to acquire conservation lands. So Explore Volusia is to get people out onto those conservation lands to know what their tax dollars are going towards. One of our important plants in these barrier islands are all across the lagoon are mangroves. So in this area right here we can name all three different types of mangroves. Does anyone know the three different types? Black, white, and red. Black, white, and red. We've been wanting to learn a lot about the environment here in Florida since we're new to the area just the past few years. So we try to make a lot of trays, um, out, outreach programs to learn more about the environment. It's an experience that I would suggest everybody to come and see. Uh, and participate in some of the deals that, you know, that they have going on here and a, a good way of meeting a lot of different people, you know, from different areas. It's important to show people, you know, give them an idea they can see firsthand some of the problems. Like for example, today they'll get to learn about the problems in the Indian River Lagoon with water quality, maybe problems with fertilizers. Um, algal blooms, different things. So now we're going to test nitrates. And if you're familiar with fertilizers, nitrate is um, one of the big ones. pH and nitrate are the only ones that change color for really. these. Go ahead and kind of see what we're we're looking at here. Oh, it's like a different 
color. It's it orange is versus different. pink. It is a little different color. I learned about the uh, the water, the pH balance, the salt balance, just a whole lot of information. We can go ahead and start launching. Just all stay in this area. Uh, I want to be a marine biologist when I get older, and I like kayaking and. My daughter's interested in marine biology. She wants to study it when she like, gets older. So we'll do whatever we can to uh, help with their schooling. Today I saw mangroves, red, white, and black mangroves. Uh, the sea beans, water, of course. Oyster beds and birds. My favorite part was learning about the mangroves, I guess. Because uh, it's kind of interesting to learn how they get rid of their salt and why they're there. The ultimate takeaway is the importance of these conservation lands, how they're corridors for animals to go through Volusia County, and that why we have them. It's water recharge zones, um, just the overall importance of our, our conservation lands and why they're there. It's, it's a big takeaway that people to get from the program. I think this is an absolutely awesome program. This is just really a great opportunity. This is neat. This is something like this got to keep going on. They said I couldn't dream. Called me a piece of trash and swore that's all I'd ever be. Said a bottle couldn't see the ocean. Give up. Go back to the dumpster. But I didn't listen. I made my way. And now, I am what I've always wanted to be. And now it's time to go into the studio to join the Director of Community Information, Joanne Magley, and her guest, Chad Weber, with the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. Thanks, Amber. Well, although Florida's boating season never really ends, warmer weather brings out thousands of boaters to our Volusia County waterways. So today I'm joined in the studio with Chad Weber from the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, also known as the FWC. Hi, Chad. Hello. Thanks for being here today. Thanks for having me. So Florida is the boating capital of the world, you know, nearly one million registered vessels. Uh, in the state of Florida, but with that high number also um, brings with it accidents. So give us a little perspective on safety as it, as it concerns boating season. Well, and like you said, we, we do have probably the highest number in the United States of registered vessels, but along with that, the number of waterways we have. We're completely surrounded by water and inland waterways. So um, with that being said, the number of people that are on the water, there's gonna be some accidents. Um, a lot of our accidents are caused by operator inattentiveness and uh, just not knowing their equipment. So um, when you say inattentiveness, they're just, they're not looking where they're going? It, it could be that. Uh, you know, boating is seen as such a, a fun and recreational thing. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes people don't understand the hazards or the dangers that, that come along with boating. So what about bad weather? What should boaters do if they're out on their boat and all of a sudden, you know, a pop-up thunderstorm comes and maybe they weren't ready for that? Um, always check the weather before you go out. Bad weather, obviously, you know, in the state of Florida, during the summer you can anticipate a summer thunderstorm probably around 3 o'clock. Usually you can set your clock by it. Um, if that were to happen, you know, seek cover because we do have a lot of lightning in central Florida area. Uh, but always check the radar, uh, the radar, and check on the weather before you go out. Just have a have a plan of action. And you mentioned inattentiveness with with boaters. Um, what are some of the other causes for accidents on the waterways? I'm I'm sure alcohol 
p plays a part and you know when you're out there on on someone else's boat you see people kind of going pretty fast so what are some of the other causes for for accidents um careless operation reckless operation uh, you mentioned alcohol alcohol is a big factor uh, we have no open container law in the state of florida on a on a boat um, but that doesn't mean that the operator doesn't can just drink as much as you want and operate the boat. It's still 0.08. Uh, a lot of our accidents do involve alcohol and operator error. Um, FWC has a zero tolerance when it comes to boating under an influence. If uh, we catch you boating under an influence, you will go to jail. So say I decide I want to go out and buy a boat. What do I have to do before I can actually take it out on the water and, and take it somewhere? We recommend that everybody takes a boater safety class. However, it's state law. Anybody born after January 1st, 1988 is required to have a better safety ID card. Uh, some of the things to consider are the number of hours you have operating the vessel that you're buying. Um, we don't recommend you go buy a high-powered boat and you've never operated before. Mm -hmm. And with the million boaters that you say we have, go run that through you know where everybody's recreating. Uh, so knowing your vessel and uh, having the appropriate safety equipment on your boat is a, a good start. Um, but also having some experience operating the boat that you're buying. So there's a number of boating regulations mm -hmm. that the FWC has. What are the most um, common regulations that uh, you that are violated? I, I guess um, I should say. Well, going into that, first off, we'll go into the safety equipment that's required. Uh, every boat's required to have a personal flotation device for everybody that's on board. Any boat over 16 feet in length is required to have a Type 4 throwable. Um, it looks like a seat cushion with the straps or like a buoy ring. Uh, a fire extinguisher for any vessel that has compartments that can entrap fuel vapor. And a uh, horn bell or whistle, a sound producing device. So the most common uh, violations that we see are usually speed zone violations where there's manatees or or things like that or um, the lack of safety equipment not having enough personal flotation devices mm -hmm. um, and that's the biggest thing uh, life jackets save lives and that's why we always push that so having that is a big step um, some of the other violations is any child under the age of six is required to wear a life jacket at all times when the boat's underway so we see that a lot too um, so we encourage that everybody wears a life jacket. So I was just going to say, you know, the six and under must wear a life jacket. You encourage everybody else to. Why is it so important to, for adults uh, to not just, you know, have the life jacket under the seat, but to wear it? I imagine, you know, you never know when an accident can happen. Absolutely. Accidents can happen at any time. Um, and you may be a great swimmer, but if you're thrown out of the boat, you're in a lot of stress and stress, you may not be thinking clearly, so having that life jacket could, could save you. And it also makes it a lot easier for us to find you if you were to fall out of a boat. Yeah, on that same um, uh, subject area, there's also some safety devices that you recommend regarding uh, maybe beacons uh, that help people find you if, if you are in distress. Talk about some of, some of those uh, devices. Um, yeah, the EPIRB, the technology that we have now is uh, definitely set up to save lives. Um, an EPIRB, if you fall overboard in the ocean, it sends a uh, GPS coordinate where you are. It's a, a beacon and uh, we're able to look on a database for that or U.S. Coast Guard. It makes it a lot easier to find either the boat or the people. So the EPIRB is something that's on a person or that's something that's attached to the boat? Uh, either or. You can attach it to the boat or on a person. And then aren't there also devices, is it the same device that also, that attaches just to the person? Because I read a little bit about certain beacons. Well, there, yeah, there's different beacons you can buy. There's some that are bigger that, are, that go with a boat. Um, and there's some that you just attach to your life jacket or to your belt. So it's been almost seven months since Hurricane Matthew. And I know here in Volusia County, we are still um, experiencing debris in our waterways. What have you seen uh, since the storm, I mean, like I said, we're seven months away, what, what do you recommend for boaters to be aware of that, uh, whether it's hurricane debris that's, that's still around or any other kind of water hazard that they might not be anticipating? Well, I mean, it's, it goes with 
operating the boat um, to be aware of your surroundings. Uh, just because we did have a hurricane, there, there are still a lot of things that are in the waterways. Uh, just to be aware of that, if you see those, to report it to us. Um, there's some submerged objects, but that, that goes with everyday boating, um, especially on intercoastal where it's tidally influenced mm -hmm. and there may be a sandbar exposed during you know, low tide, but then when the high tide comes in, you still may be able to run aground on a sandbar. Uh, or if it's the St. John's River where there is a lot of downfall in trees. Uh, the vessel operator should always be aware of these things because um, you're pretty much in charge of those people that are on your boat and it's, it's your uh, responsibility to get them back safe. All right, let's switch gears now a little bit and uh, kind of just talk about all the positives that come with boating here in Volusia County. Give us, uh, give us a glimpse a little bit of from whether you're on the St. John's River or the intercoastal waterway or even the ocean and just the different perspectives you get from, from all those experiences. Well, and we did talk a lot about violations and citations and things like that. Uh, boating is, well, living in the state of Florida, boating is a big part of it. And uh, we don't want to discourage people from coming out and enjoy the waterways. Uh, we encourage it, we just want people to do it the right way. And there are so many things. I mean, uh, getting your kids outdoors is a great thing. Uh, on the St. John's River, going to the different springs that are there, uh, fishing on the intercoastal or offshore. So it, it provides a lot of recreation for the state of Florida. And like I said, we encourage people to go and enjoy that but we just want them to do it safely. So if people observe other boaters operating a vessel dangerously, uh, what do you suggest that they do? Um, they can always call it in to uh, our toll-free number, 1-888-404-3922, uh, or they can text it to uh, STAR FWC. Um, obviously, there's, we're officers. We can't be everywhere at once, so we do rely sometimes on the public to uh, keep an eye out for stuff like that and help us you know, to know where we need to go to enforce these different violations. And of course, you have a lot of information on your website, myfwc.com slash boating. Yep. So Chad Weber from the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, thanks so much for being here today. Thanks for having me. Amber, back to you. Thanks, Joanne, and thank you for watching Volusia Magazine. If you have any questions about the show, you can feel free to give us a call at any of the numbers you see listed here or you can log on to volusia.org and click on the news tab at the top of the screen to find us. And we hope you won't forget to listen to Volusia Today. That's Volusia County Government's weekly public radio broadcast. Volusia Today airs every Tuesday, Wednesday, and Sunday mornings on the local radio stations you see on your screen. For Volusia Magazine, I'm Amber Osmond, and I hope you have a wonderful evening.